It's not that when you talk about the MBA, you're talking about something completely different from what you are doing in your own reality, daily, daily world. It's just a different level of, uh, of organization, different level of technology, different level of, it's a different, you know, it's a different dimension. But I think at, at the base, uh, you all need to understand the different world of relationships that uh, are very different from international basketball compared to the NBA. What I'm saying, when I say world of relationship is, sorry if I stop once in a while because it's, it's, it's painful. <laughs> uh, in the, you know, internationally, you know, we have all our different levels, you know, first division, second division, third division. We understand how important it is to go from one level to another. We understand the weekly drama of games that needs to be win at all cost. And uh, we, we understand what it means to be relegated to a lower division, to lose sponsorship, to lose attendance, to have the fans running after you on the street. Um, it's funny, <laughs> when I talk about the NBA, uh, you, you, you can imagine our arena is almost packed every time, 20,000 people at the game every night and uh, the most like the most violent thing that you hear from the stands is VC stinks VC is Vince Carter that the fans don't like anymore so they say VC stinks in my country in Italy not even a little kid says stinks you know they just go after you with you know with anything you know that's to tell you the difference of the fans culture but that being said, it's a different system. The commercial league has a different ph philosophy. The international basketball has a total different philosophy, which brings to, let's say, two different worlds of relationships. In international basketball, the management of the club, particularly the GM and the coach, are probably the leading light of any picture. That's where the decisions are made. The, I think what is the, I remember in my years in Benetton, yeah, we had the CEO of the company, but basically the, every decision was made on the, let's say on the connection, GM, head coach. And that was how the, the team was managed. In the NBA, it's not really like that. Why? Definitely the ownership of the club is important. Definitely the managers are important. But because of a different system, like the commercial league, the importance of the players is much more you know, significant. And behind them, of course, the agents are much more significant. At the end of the day, it's in a simple way, they always say the NBA is more a players league while international basketball is a, is a management coaches league. It's, very, very, it's a very, very simple way to describe it, but being inside, I think is very, very, is, I would say it's true. You perceive a different way to handle people. In Europe, uh, you know, if I'm a manager of a club and I have my players to handle, I can have a much more direct approach. I can, you know, almost provoke a reaction, not being afraid of reaction, being comfortable with anything that I want to say or do. Over there, I have to think more. I have to understand exactly if it's, you know, if how that is going to reflect on a world of other relationships. And uh, you cannot imagine, and I can imagine what, ha I'm talking about my club, where that is, you know, it's a, it's a young club without a true superstar. But I can imagine uh, what happens in clubs with, uh, with, with true superstars. I think a lot of decisions are always subject to 
somebody else's opinion. You know, it's a it's a world of connection that is very very you know the uh, players have much more importance in their in their in their relationship than what they have in our in our let's say international way of doing of doing the business. Uh, that would be the initial premise, you know, that's, that's the pitch. Then when you go down more specifically to how to organize the, you know, the, the work inside the, uh, uh, the locker room, again, it's just a matter of having a lot of resources, a lot of uh, money, people, and uh, I'd like to give you an idea of what we are in, you know, a typical organization like ours in Toronto, compared to what, for example, I had a Benetton with uh, Bradovic rather than Messina, rather than uh, Mike D'Antoni. I mean, this, but basketball is basketball. Just, a, it's just different the, the level of organization. Uh, NBA bench outside of the, you know, the head coach, there is a nice group of assistants. And uh, you have three assistant coaches who can sit on the bench. And now it's becoming more and more important the role of the workout coach. The workout coach is basically someone who is really signed to specifically work on the player's development, especially the young player's development. Therefore, uh, let's say their role is not very important in terms of strategize the game, but it's very important in getting the players ready for the game. So to give you an idea, uh, whenever you, you move around with, with the team, you always go with two buses. And the buses are always half hour away from each other. So when you go for the game, on the first bus, there are always the workout coach, coaches, maybe one or two of the assistant coaches, and all the young players. Because they need to get to the arena early. They need to go through the drills with the workout coach. They need to work on their game with their workout coaches. Because on the contrary of uh, what we do in Europe. The opportunity to practice are not that many. In the NBA, you play a lot of games. You realize that you play 82 games in 170 days. So it's basically every other day. So if you consider the opportunities to practice, they're very, very few. And, uh, and believe it or not, in our, in our way of doing things, having a double practice during the week is something that can happen once or even twice on a regular basis throughout the season. In the NBA, you can have a double practice only at the start of the, of the camp, early in October, the first week, and you can only have four days of double practices. And the four days of double practices can lead to a maximum. I mean, every day you can't practice more than three hours and 10 minutes. It, everything is, they have a book with thousands of rules. It includes also how long your practice on a double day can be at the beginning of the season. And uh, if you, for example, if you decide to have a stronger practice in the morning and to have your players tape to have practice, you cannot tape in the afternoon. What I'm saying is you can only do one game, one practice with tape ankles. And again, these are part of the old collective bargaining agreement. That's what is being discussed right now. But that's the rule there's always been. So basically, only four days of double practice in the entire season. So you can imagine it's a different way of working. Uh, some of the coaches, I can imagine Obradovic, why he keeps saying no NBA, he would drive crazy for something like this. I want to see Messina now going to the Lakers and having to witness, you know, 
a different mentality, a different world. But this is the way the, the, the rules are, and this is the way everybody accepts it. It's not that uh, nobody's questioning either the coaches or the players. So you can understand that I have to ask you a favor. I put my chair here, but I need to sit down because I'm starting to sweat. No, 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 I'm okay, but my leg is killing me. I used to be a bad athlete, so anyway. Ah, shit. Ooh. I'm sorry. Uh, so, what I'm saying is, I, wanna, I don't want to miss something. Thank you. Thank you. It's very, in, going back to the premise, coaches, managers are in a situation to basically decide how to organize their work how to do it anytime, how to sur surprise your own players, how to punish men, <laughs> how to give a bonus by canceling time and whatever. Anyway, you have more and more freedom. You have more and more independence in the international basketball than in the NBA. One of the things that surprised me the first time when I got there, I was there in September and there were uh, a few players just uh, getting ready for the start of training camp. At the end of September, keep in mind that practices start first week in October and the season starts November 1st. At the end of September, when the players get together for their physicals, they get the entire program through the potential first round of playoffs, where they have every single moment of their day already planned in detail, including practices, games, flights, uh, team meetings, uh, sponsors, uh, you know, every, they have to, all of us, because I'm, I, have to, I have to say I'm included in the same thing, all of us has different additions for different, let's say, sponsorship or media encounters or radio programs. Everybody gets a detailed program of everything for the following seven, eight months, in detail. So nothing can be done outside of that unless there is a major panic or a major emergency. Everything is, is planned ahead of time and there are no surprises. Sometimes I, it's just like when I see the, the schedule that comes out, usually the NBA schedule comes out at the end of July. Pretty much the Italian league schedule was coming out at the end of July. And uh, making the comparison, at the beginning of September, so two months before the season starts, <coughs> in the NBA, you know exactly every game that is being televised on every channel, on every state, everywhere through the playoffs. In Italy, we decide every 15 days based on how the season goes. That's, that's, a, that's a major, it's a major difference of perspective. They want to know exactly ahead of time because they want to build on the, on the marketing, they want to build on the, on the promoting the events, they want to get things organized. Again, the, the level of organization is a different level. That being said, so you can see my bus leaving for the game. By the way, no practice the day before of the game in the arena where the game is being played. That, 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 that's impossible because in the NBA, every arena, as always, is such a big arena that they're hosting major events all the time. So, for example, I don't know, you can play basketball and the night before they had hockey or Madonna or Lady Gaga or whatever. But what I'm saying is the arena works all year round. The Maple Leafs, uh, you know, the, our, our group, we own our own arena, the, the Air Canada Centre. The Air Canada Centre is busy almost 300 days a year out of 360. It's the second most successful venue, money-wise, 
for entertainment behind the Madison Square Garden in the world. So you can imagine all the artists going through. Plus, we host the Maple Leafs, which is like the historical uh, hockey team of the country in a hockey country. So you can imagine how busy the arena is. So no way anywhere you go to practice on the court where you have the game the following night. If you get there early, you can look for a gym somewhere or university or something you know, that they help you finding, but no way. Instead, just like we do at, in the, you know, most of the leagues or European competition, you get one hour the morning of the game for your shoot around. So you have a one hour shoot around and in between the media, they meet the players and coming from one shoot around with the other ones going to the other shoot around. So they connect at the same time. That being said, in the afternoon, and that's why we're going back to my bus. Uh, the game usually is 7 o'clock game most of the time. And when it's you know, 4.30, the first bus heads to the arena, goes to the arena. And you have the workout coaches. You have the young assistant coaches, all the young players, whoever wants to, the strength coaches. Our organization, we also had three video people always traveling with the team. So uh, that's to tell you how sophisticated the te technological aspect is when uh, each, each coach, for example, as, as, at his own uh, Mac computer, they always travel with their, with their computer with them. Uh, everything was standard for everybody. Everybody had his own. I, you know, you're, I'm talking, and I have very, very little knowledge of technology. But I know that we were given our BlackBerry, our Mac, our every, everybody had the same. They set up their video room inside the locker room, and at the end of the game. We probably take, uh, I would say, half hour at the very, very most to get on the bus to get to the plane. And uh, by the time the coaches get on the plane to leave, uh, everybody, all the coaches have already the game in their computer downloaded uh, with all the plays, all the mistakes. Everything they ask before the game is being analyzed already. So they go and, and just basically review the game based on what they ask for the video people before the game. So it's a pretty you know, nice way to follow the game that is just being played. At the same time, they have already on the computer the, the older work for the follow, following game. So uh, it's a uh, uh, you know, it's interesting. It's interesting the way that uh, uh, I want to show you something. I, I cannot leave it because it's, it's, uh, what, it's sensitive material. It looks like we're talking CIA or something, but it's, uh, it's, uh, this is sensitive material. But like, for example, something that I think some of you does the same way. It's not that, again, we're talking about basketball. We're not talking about uh, basketball is basketball. Just you know, different, different, different way in details. But for example, this was the, the, ma the, the manual that is being given to every player at the end of the season. We get something like this similar in, uh, in a disc for every game. So everything is broken up with the same concept. So I, I brought this one to show you for the end of the season. But you can imagine something like this for every game. And every player gets his own you know, manual, has to read it, has to study. They sit down with, for example, there is one assistant coach who works for the guard, one assistant coach who works with the small forward, one assistant. Eh, they go through computer. They, you know, this is when they get ready in preparation for the game. And, um, you know, I'll go through this, through this later, but basically every, every player now at the end of the season, I can give you an example of, uh, uh, just not to choose Barniani by, by coincidence. You know, he's got a list of all the things that he has to work on at the end of the season. This is the map 
of all his shooting for the season. So in the, the red part is where it's, of course, hot, and the blue part where it's cold, so the percentage went down. All the practices, all the practices during the season are, are being graded. So the coaches, at the end of every practice, they work on the stats. They take stats of every practice we do. And then they grade every practice to follow the quality of the, of the player throughout the season. So you have a map of you know, A, B, C, D, injury, D, not, you know, whatever is, is the reading. And then uh, basically, and they even give every player you know, the drills to work on for the summer. Just like going in a, sounds like a little bit scholastic, but it's, it's, pretty, it's, you know, it's pretty effective. Uh, that being said, I'm going back to my bus. And the 430 bus is going to the arena. And, uh, and you have uh, all these people. They set up the video room inside the, the, tra you know, the, the, the locker room. The strength, we have the strength and conditioning coach. For the past two years, we had uh, Francesco Cuzzolin, who was the strength and conditioning coach at uh, Benetton for many years. And I believe he's one of the best in, uh, in the world. And he's now going to be the, the head guy of the Italian Federation program. But he's, he's, a, he's, a, very, he's a great guy. And, and he had a couple of assistants. And they start working on the players on the court. We have our own way to prepare you know, to warm up for the games. There, you know, they almost have strategized which player are going to enter the court first, who's got to go first, who's got to work with. So you would see, I don't know, the uh, two or three of the big men working with the big man coach, uh, two or three of the following then the, the, the small forwards, and then uh, uh, another young guy. It's like a a sequence that is being planned ahead of time. And they always do pretty much the same thing every time. And it, the first players are always on the court, sometimes at least two hours before the game. So two hours before the game, you can see players getting on the court and getting ready to, you know, to warm up. Five o'clock is the second bus going to the arena. And you have the head coach, most likely the lead assistant coach with him. And of course, all the veteran players, they feel like they don't need the extra work, so they, they get on the, on the second bus. The point is understanding which one is the veteran player. Sometimes there are questions, who should be on the first bus, who should be on the second bus? And you have to be very careful at not touching people's ego, because some, for some players, being on the second bus is important, because it's like, hey, I'm on the second bus. So, uh, you, have, you have to be, you know, you have to be careful. But second bus also has, uh, uh, you know, everyone else connected to the club. So, for example, if I am on the road, I would be, no, actually, I actually go on the first bus because I like to, to be in, in the arena anyway. But uh, media people uh, the, that travel with the team will be on the bus. Uh, you know, anyway, that's the second bus who gets to the arena. And the veteran players are always the last group of guys that does that individual workout on the court. Then they all come back to the locker room. Coaches speak, speaks to the group. And usually the, you know, the real warm-up is probably, I would say, 18, 20 minutes at the very, very most. But that's including the presentation, so it's a, sh it's a short team warm-up. Because everybody has basically prepared the game on his own. Uh, what can I say? It's a, um, the one good thing about the NBA is you can find the standards of what you offer to, to the host team or to the teams traveling pretty much in every arena. So you, you have uh, you know, good quality locker rooms. You have everything to put your video room together. By the way, 
the doctors never travel with the team because the doctor is always responsibility of the host team. So there are no doctors traveling with the team. And when you talk about an NBA team like ours, we have a, a doctor, an orthopedian, a chiropractor, we have a, a dentist, we have, you know, we have all sorts of different doctors, but no one travels with the team because it's always, and even when they have to decide, for example, if a player who gets injured can play or not play, it's that doctor that decides. So you can, you can understand how comfortable they are with the doctor's opinion. In Europe, it would be very <laughs> questionable. But uh, that's, uh, that, that's another thing. Uh, to give you an idea, our locker room is not only, uh, uh, let's say, we have a, s a circle locker room, so everybody faces each other, everybody has his own uh, space, you know, with uh, uh, all the different, uh, you know, technology included, names, it's very fancy. But then everything is around that circle. What I'm saying is, in the back, we have, uh, you know, the, the water, water places where they do therapy, we have a uh, jacuzzi, we have uh, uh, trade mills in the water, we have, you know, all sorts of, then we have a huge uh, physiotherapy room with uh, like four beds and all the, the doctors, three do doctor's offices, it's like, you know, it's very, very organized. Then we have another area where the players get together or spend time in, uh, in getting ready for the game or, or in between practices because sometimes when they practice in the morning there are players who instead of going home they just lay on the couch and rest before you know the you know sometimes the, the game is early in the afternoon and in this area we have some some sort of a kitchen area we have the chef of one of the restaurants of the arena bringing a full meal for the players, so the players can have a full meal e every day of the game. After, pra after the shoot around in the morning, there is always full meal available for the players. Uh, they can relax, they can do anything. Uh, that's like part, it's like, it's like a, an apartment attached to the, to the locker room area. Then in the back, to complete the apartment, we have created an area for the players' families. So the players can come and leave the family in another area where they have all sorts of games. They have the, the pool, they have the, uh, um, anything for kids and, and wives. And so it's, it's a true situation of, uh, uh, where you try to do everything you can to please players, their families, and get them ready. They don't have to worry about anything. All they have to worry is about showing up and, and be ready to play, to play the game. And that's, that's the old philosophy. Do everything that you can to get them in a situation to be ready, ready to play. So that being said, um, I don't know how, how um, how more specific I can get in terms of um, um, trying to describe the relationships. But definitely, compared to the way we handle our own business in international basketball, I would say the connections between the coaching staff and the management staff are, uh, I would say, not as tight as they are in, 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 our, in our situation. What I'm saying is, not necessarily managers travel with the team all the time. Uh, one thing that I discovered in the NBA, and I thought it was different, is that at the end of the day, uh, you see, for example, you see me here at the World Championship, I would have come anyway because I needed to come here to scout young talent, but every member of the organization is a potential scout. So you see, in our case, our general manager, Brian Colangelo, he travels to probably, I don't know, 
20 different locations during the year to watch college basketball. He has flown to Europe this year. You know, we have, we have come to Lithuania to watch Valentunas, to Spain to watch Bayombo. Uh, we went to Partizan twice to watch Vesely. We travel all over. What I'm saying is the manager group is more dynamic, more on the road, always following the quality of the, let's say, or what they have to make the final decision on, which, which much more, uh, let's say, aggressiveness than what, than what we do. Uh, we don't see managers in our business over here that do travel as much as the normal, let's say, front office people do in the NBA. And, um, but that's why the, the coaching staff is very independent in terms of uh, the organization of their, uh, you know, uh, daily life. You know, it's, it's a, the relationship is players and, uh, and, uh, and, and coaching staff. And the coaching staff sometimes has supports that uh, can be appreciated and uh, or sometimes uh, are not appreciated that much. For example, in our case, we have hired two people that are working with numbers. So they don't live necessarily in Toronto. As a matter of fact, one lives in Japan and one lives in, in California. And they work on numbers to analyze everything that is happening to the team. Why things are happening, let's say, in a positive way, in a negative way. Why, are, let's say, this, is these two players a good combination rather than this? I mean, the coaches, if they want to, they have this 24-7 number support to better analyze whatever we are doing and even whatever the, the other teams are doing. And by the way, these numbers are amazing when you get to study the players for the draft because they really give you a, a clear understanding of the value of the players, wherever they are, because they study the system that somehow translates, I say, college numbers into European numbers into other numbers in order to have a, a consistent way to evaluate players. And, and the numbers, again, are important because they are also the support when we think about trading players, not trading players, changing the team. Basically, they can tell you as far as what, you know, not necessarily is a, is a perfect science, but they can tell you in advance if these two players' combination can work with the rest of the combination based of the team based on the numbers. They can tell me if uh, LeBron James coming in is a good fit for the Raptors, or if, uh, I don't know, uh, Omar Caspi is a good fit to be a backup. I'm saying the numbers are becoming more and more important around the league. And I would say, I would say one third of the teams right now as under contract number people, what I call people that works on numbers. So that's one support that the coaching staff has, and the same support actually is translated to the management group. The other support is the psychologist. We do use a, a, a sport psychologist, and it, the job is very important trying to understand the candidates through the draft process, but it's also important to you know, understand the, you know, what's going on during the season, if there are issues, if there are not issues. Have a, some sort of a general conversation once in a while with one player rather than another. We are using the sports psychologist and usually has given us, uh, you know, pretty interesting results. So, and most, and, and I would say most of the teams are using a, a sports psychologist. To give you an idea, uh, we just drafted Jonas Valanciunas, and uh, one of the most difficult things was finding a way to connect him to our psychologist because, uh, you know, he had his season, he had his national team obligation, 
but the psychologists need to see him and talk to him and, and go through every team, every team in the draft process as a psychology, psych psychological test. All the players go through this test. Certain teams have of a certain kind, other teams, have, but the psycholog psychological test is mandatory in, uh, is, a, is an important piece in the selection of the player. You cannot imagine how much emphasis, how much importance is put on the psychological test. So finally, we found a way to connect Jonas with our psychologist on Skype. And it was, uh, you know, it was, uh, it worked because they could talk for an hour, they could, you know, understand each other, they get to know each other again face to face because we're not involved. But the, the psychologist could draw a picture of Jonas. And um, the, well, that's another thing, but you know, the draft process is extremely detailed for something like this. And you cannot imagine how much research we do on every player. Uh, you cannot imagine. It, in, in, and I'm talking, of course, about the American players, because that's not possible all the time with the international players, but the research goes from when they were two years old to when they are ready to be drafted. And, it, and it's, uh, you know, they all, any sort of police control, any sort of go back and talk to the elementary school, to the high school, to the people. You know, it's like you cannot imagine the work behind those few names that you, have, you, that you want to be ready to select every year. It's an amazing number of, you know, when our draft process is over, <laughs> you feel like, in Italy we are a way of saying, the, the mountain has generated a mouse, okay? Which means, like this year, we have selected, we only have one name, because we didn't have a second round pick, and we selected Jonas. But then we look at the table, we have like a mountain of data, of uh, reports, of psychological tests, of very, you know, it's like a huge amount of data coming from the analysis of all these players that also will be helpful in certain ways down the road because all these data are then inserted in, in our database and the database has, will keep those information for, for a long time and we can always go back to those, uh, to those uh, infos. By the way, uh, we also, um, you know, we have signed up with different uh, how you call uh, video, DVD, or you know programs, in order to basically have all the games that are being played around the world. Whether it's done through a company like Synergy or through you know other companies, we try to have a, a full coverage of any game that is playing that is played anywhere. Uh, I see friends from Australia but this morning, but you know, we picked an Australian player three years ago and one way or the other we, had, we were able to watch him playing eight, ten games and still we sent our scout a couple of times during the season to watch him, to watch him play. What I'm saying is there is a lot, a lot, a lot of work to do behind just, you know, selecting the player or putting a team together. But um, I wish I could show you our locker room, um, you know, the way, the way the locker room, the dynamic of the locker room is. But uh, one thing, for example, that I push for, <laughs> because we had a very European team uh, when, I, when, I, when I got there, we, we just got, you know, Bargnani selected and we had uh, Garbajosa, uh, Calderon, Slokar, and then I always counted Anthony Parker as a European, but he was not European. And, uh, but we had a lot of, so they didn't really understand, you know, how the league works in terms of division, conference, et cetera, records. Et cetera. So we created a major uh, backboard inside the, inside the locker room where we, we, we see it all the time. <coughs> where we are in the league, you know, what our record is, and they understand what we need to do to get to the playoffs. So that's, that becomes very, very clear. In the area 
of the coaches, we have a big board where we basically update all the rosters of every team. Then we have another board where basically we, we work on the st strategies for the game. We have, we have advanced scouts. Advanced scouts means scouts that go and scout the other, the coming up teams over the, you know, the, the two, three weeks before we play them. So we have them coming in to bring the report to the coach. And sometimes they are part of the morning shoot around to show exactly what the other, the opposing teams is, is doing. Because the one thing that you will find is that in the NBA, on the contrary of, uh, of most of the teams that internationally, the game probably is played at a quicker pace or in a more, I, I don't want to say, it's not superficial, but it's a little bit lighter probably during the, during the regular season compared to the playoff action. That it's very, very common for teams to change plays, you know, short plays, you know, just on calls right away. So you could have, a, you could have teams changing, uh, I don't know, t you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 plays in a season. In the playoff situation, the plays are almost different every game. There are always counter plays from the games before. So there is the advanced scout works is important. The analysis of every, of every game is important because sometimes it's, uh, it's uh, I don't want to say that it looks like uh, one of those, uh, I don't know whoever watches baseball that they call with all these numbers, but it's becoming more like a volleyball or baseball game because of all the way, all the different looks that the teams want to give to the opposing to the opposing team, even if at the end of the day probably they run the same cut or the same pick and roll move, but you know they start in a hundred different kind of setups. So that being said, um, I'm just trying. I don't want to. I don't want to put you asleep. You know that's important. But uh, I would say. The other thing that kind of surprised me in this experience is the fact that uh, over there you can wear different hats and that's perfectly normal. Uh, you can be Pat Riley and doing the play-by-play -play on TV near the Lakers bench and be called two days later by coincidence to coach the Lakers and become the greatest, one of the greatest coaches. And then, and that's perfectly normal. And then from there, you can become general manager and president. And that's perfectly normal. And then eventually you can decide, no, at this point I coach. I'm taking Pat Riley because he's one of the greatest, but that's to give you an idea of, in their system, anybody can actually do anything. We don't have that sort of mental habits, flexibility, and uh, for us, sometimes it can be, hey, we can't do this, or hey, I've never done it. No, it's perfectly normal to go from being a, a scout to be a manager, from a manager to be a TV guy, from a TV guy to be any other. There is a lot of flexibility. You get interviewed for the new position, or you get, you know, you get evaluated for the new position, and you get the job. In our reality, very, very seldomly, we see a coach becoming a GM, or a GM becoming a TV guy, or, you know, well, I mean, what I'm saying is we're more structured. We, um, sometimes, you know, I remember <laughs> uh, one of, Two of my closest friends in the NBA, especially at the beginning, were, uh, I don't know if you remember Kiki Vandeweg. Kiki Vandeweg has been one of the greatest players. And when I met him, he was uh, basically doing some TV, uh, TV for, for Dallas Mavericks. And then I got him involved in the big man camp and the Euro camp that we were running in Treviso. 
and he was there as a coach because uh, in the summer he was the one who was actually working with the famous Pete Newell and so Kiki van der Weg was his main guy at the Pete Newell's camp and then a few months later is the GM president at the Denver Nuggets and then a few months later is on ESPN what I'm saying is and everything is normal in this procedure uh, I, I remember one of my trips to New York I, got, I go to the New York Knicks office and I'm sitting with the president and the president is S Scott Layden well two months ago Scott Layden who is an excellent person a great person was is so good and humble that he was one of the assistant coaching throwing the passes at the pre-draft camp in Chicago we are not we don't have that mentality we sometimes probably we would say no I I can't do that that's too much uh, I have to say that I had a problem with that at the beginning not only because maybe I was let's say the GM for 30 years and I was stepping into a situation where I was basically not the number one guy anymore but in my mind I said nah I can't travel so much I can't go like this I can't do it but then at the end of the day you realize that that's the old system doing the same thing accepting the same principles interacting in a certain way and accepting the same rules and that is that that is very very different from our way of approaching the the basketball world and sometimes maybe maybe uh, that could open up more opportunities for everybody because uh, being more flexible more open to something like this I think it it, it might help the only thing that <laughs> that I don't accept, uh, which I don't think is ethical, but it, it has happened recently over the past uh, couple of years, two or three major agents have become executives on teams. I think that that, that is a very, very borderline situation because it's not, uh, it's not very ethical. But that being said, Another major difference is they can switch ads with much more flexibility. It's very natural. You can make a million dollar one year. You can go and make a hundred thousand dollars the following year just based on how the how the opportunities are, and it's perfectly normal. And uh, again, I told you at the beginning, I was not a professional speaker and I was not a coach either so I just want to try to share with you as much as I can of my unique experience <laughs>